Uh, we'd like to get started. I think we're a little bit behind. And uh, we are going to be, you can please uh, take your seats. We're going to be discussing uh, gene therapy uh, in this panel. Uh, now, gene therapy has been a dream for many decades, uh, certainly at, at least since the advent of cloning, if not before. Uh, scientists have discussed the enormous therapeutic potential that could be unleashed if only we could deliver genes to damaged human cells to initiate a positive therapeutic response, um, or if we could correct deleterious gene mutations at the level of the genome. Uh, this dream, however, has been long in the coming, uh, and there have been a few false starts, including in the 1990s. Uh, but in recent years, we've turned a corner, and uh, gene therapy uh, is becoming a reality, and one that is coming on fast. So today's uh, panel uh, will take stock of the, uh, the uh, current state of gene therapy and the promise of gene therapy for the future. Uh, and address uh, the many dimensions uh, of this uh, therapy, the scientific aspects, uh, the clinical and regulatory aspects, uh, and issues related to uh, the development um, of, of such, uh, not just issues related to the development, but also to the, the delivery and also the, um, uh, uh, the pricing and reimbursement of what could be, in some cases, uh, one-shot cures. We'll also discuss some of the ethical issues uh, related to introducing new genes and to editing the human genome in patients. Now, with me today to address these issues is an all-star cast, uh, starting with uh, Peggy Hamburg, who uh, I believe is well known to absolutely everyone here. Of course, until very recently, the commissioner of the US Food and Drug Administration, uh, where uh, she made uh, really remarkable contributions in terms of strengthening the agency's ability um, to apply the best available science um, to uh, the regulatory process and also to respond to new technologies in a, a more nimble way. Uh, she's also well known to uh, all of us here in New York because she was the commissioner of the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Um, and she also has uh, had a number of other roles, including uh, at the uh, Department of Health and Human Services. Um, Nick Leshley. Uh, to her left is the president and CEO of Bluebird Bio, a startup based in Boston that's focused on uh, gene therapy. Uh, Nick uh, has, is a veteran of the industry. Uh, he was at Millennium Pharmaceuticals uh, during the development of uh, Velcade, in fact, was the product leader um, for uh, Velcade, and then uh, held other positions uh, after that, uh, including being a, a partner and founding member of Third Rock Ventures uh, before taking his current position um, at uh, Bluebird. Uh, Glenn Steele was on the previous panel and he was uh, introduced beautifully by Roy Vagelos. Uh, he's back with us uh, again here to uh, address some of the, the, um, uh, uh, the issues related to um, delivery access uh, pricing uh, as well for this uh, in incredibly uh, promising but also complex uh, set of therapies. Uh, as you know, he is the, until recently, the, he was CEO of uh, Geisinger Health System uh, and is now the chairman of XG Health Solutions and before that uh, held positions uh, as a professor of surgery at Harvard Medical School, as dean of biological sciences and uh, the Pritzker School of Medicine uh, at the University of Chicago. And last but not least, we have Feng Zhang, uh, here, who is the W.M. Keck Career Development Professor of Biomedical Engineering uh, at MIT. Uh, Feng uh, is uh, uh, very well known in uh, gene therapy circles, and particularly gene editing uh, circles. Uh, after uh, making uh, tremendous uh, contributions as a graduate student at uh, Stanford to the whole field of optogenetics, for those of you uh, who follow this in, in neuroscience, uh, he moved to Boston where he was a, a, a junior fellow at, at Harvard and then uh, joined the faculty at MIT and uh, also at the Broad uh, to focus on gene editing initially with zinc finger nucleases and then tailings and then uh, of course uh, when the CRISPR uh, revolution started um, he was there uh, from the very beginning and has made extraordinary contributions to that as well. He's one of the, the leaders um, uh, currently uh, in that field. So uh, it's really a pleasure to have all four of them here on the panel. Now, uh, 
Rather than uh, asking each person to um, uh, make a, a speech, what I'd, I'd like to do instead is to address the major issues that I outlined, the science, uh, the uh, clinical and regulatory um, aspects, um, and uh, aspects related to um, uh, delivery and uh, uh, pricing and reimbursement. And I'll call on a couple of the panelists to address each of these issues in turn. We're going to start with the science, and I'm going to call specifically on, on Nick and, uh, and Feng. And Nick, uh, we'll start with you. Uh, what I'd like to ask you to do, and then I'll ask Feng as well, is to, to start by uh, anchoring the discussion. Tell us how we should think about gene therapy, because gene therapy isn't gene therapy isn't gene therapy. There are multiple modalities. There are different ways, uh, different uh, types of science, um, different purposes of different forms of gene therapy, and they all come with a different set of issues. So it's good to parse the issues initially. So if you could start with that. Uh, then the second thing, once you've done that, maybe tell us a little bit about the history of the field and perhaps some of the, the false starts, and then what's changed, and, and in particular, tell us about the kinds of things that you're doing today um, uh, uh, at Bluebird uh, with a focus on um, uh, gene delivery, uh, and then we'll, we'll pick up the uh, issue of genome editing, per se, after that. Nick. Wow. Okay. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you, Mark, and I did know you were going to uh, go over to me. I have to say I'm normally not nervous for these types of things, but this is a little bit different because if you happen as a newly minted public company to say anything, it's going to be tweeted about 10 seconds later up here. It's a bit nerve-wracking, and the fact that I am not a scientist and my wife is sitting in the audience who is a, a physician, so she's going to be telling me everything that I misstate afterwards, not to mention the fact that there are Nobel laureates sitting in the audience. So um, I'm going to see if I can get through the best that I can, and what you're going to get is an MBA version of gene therapy, and we'll see, we'll see how that goes. But I think the big excitement around gene therapy ever since it, the beginning is the promise, is the idea of a, of a curative uh, therapy, the idea of a fix. And I think that's something that people have wanted to move on to and get excited about because that's ultimately what physicians and ultimately what uh, want to deliver and what patients would like to receive. So one of the things that gene therapy uh, is also now recently it's gotten a very broad topic. So people say gene therapy and it's a catch-all. So maybe what I can do in the next few minutes, I'll just break it down a little bit into at least language that I can understand and hopefully many of you. In the context of there's, uh, the whole idea is you're trying to fix something. You're trying to insert something. So the classic definition of, of uh, gene therapy is gene addition and insertion. You're adding a gene back into your target cell. That's what I'm going to define as classic uh, gene therapy. We'll come back to how in a minute. You can also, and, and Feng will go into the detail on this, you can also do that, but do it in a more targeted fashion, where you're either silencing a gene through a double-stranded break, or you're also inserting a gene, again, in a targeted fashion. These are sort of evolutions or rifts of each other, but are all classified as gene therapy, and I'll go into that in a second. As you look at classic gene therapy, there, the idea is to restore a function, but you can also use this modality to engineer function into your target cell. And so with that, there's largely speaking two platforms, two viral platforms, because remember, you need to deliver this gene to a target cell somehow. You don't just throw the uh, gene onto the cell and hope for the best. There's actually a delivery mechanism. In this case, it's a viral-based or a particle that does the job. There's two forms of that. Generally, one is AAV, or adeno-associated virus. And that does its job in a non-integrating way, meaning it goes into the cell, but it does not integrate into the DNA. And it does its job expressing that uh, gene in that cell, which is great. However, if that cell dies, so does the expression. So that's one thing to think about classically when people use AAV gene therapy in a non-integrating fashion. You're going into cells that are not necessarily rapidly dividing or in areas that are privileged, such as the eye, uh, the brain. And you'll hear uh, from a company called Voyager, which is looking at CNS-based gene therapy using AAV or derivatives thereof. So you can think of it in that, that regard. Um, in that sense, you have to think about it's an in vivo delivery, so you're thinking about toxicities that is immune reaction to your delivery or to your particle. And I'll come back to that. That was an example of one of the historical challenges that, Mark, you just referenced. The other platform is retroviral, or in this case, we use something called a lentivirus. That is where you're indeed integrating into the DNA. Typically, you're doing that in cells that are rapidly dividing. So when you actually have your gene on board, you actually then will carry it from cell to cell. And that is a way to ensure expression over a long period of time. And so that is what Bluebird, the company I'm associated with, uh, does. 
And it does it in a random fashion. And Fang will talk about targeting it, but in our case, lentivirus goes into the DNA in a semi-random fashion. There are consequences with that, and there's fears with that, and we'll get to that. But the idea is, in our case, for example, you take out your blood stem cells, so as part of an autologous transplant, and uh, you take those blood stem cells and you use this virus to insert a piece of DNA in there to hopefully fix things like sickle cell, uh, thalassemia, or other very, very uh, scary diseases of, of children. And I go into those, the idea is if you fix that cell and you put it back into your bone marrow, now you can imagine that bone marrow can produce and now has a functioning copy of this gene that can produce that protein in perpetuity. So what effectively with a one-time autologous transplant, you can fix the cells. Now that only matters if that cell you put in actually differentiates and then ultimately gets to your uh, disease that you're after. And in the case of a blood disorder, it's fairly easy to think of it. So that's one example where you're restoring function. Many of you have heard about CAR therapies or chimeric antigen receptors. That's an example, and these are companies like Juno, Kite, as well as Novartis, as well as Bluebird, where you're actually taking a T cell in this case, not your blood stem cell, a T cell, and you engineer a function that targets it to a cancer, and then you allow the body to sort of expand this cell once you put it back in, but it's targeted, so you've engineered a function. All of this is gene therapy. Now, real quick, the history here, and it only is really only two examples. In 1999, a very unfortunate incident happened with Jesse Gelsinger at Penn, who was a young man who signed up for a study and unfortunately uh, was given adenovirus and had a very intense immune reaction that precipitated towards his death after four days. That was something that is obviously extremely unfortunate, but also there were some things that went on in there that was more clinically based and probably had less to do with gene therapy per se. But the, certainly the field took a major hit and a major step back, which was certainly uh, also warranted. That's on the AAV platform there. There was an immune reaction to the capsid that you put in. In the case of our world, or Bluebird's world, is on the, le on the viral side, there also was a case of uh, five leukemias that were generated in something, uh, an immune disorder called SCID. And that was a case where uh, these kids were given something which is a prior version or another virus called a gamma retrovirus, or MLV, murine leukemia virus. And in this case, uh, unfortunately, integrated in a very specific spot in the genome that caused the cell to get an advantage, caused the cell to be able to start to replicate itself, which is effectively cancer. Uh, now those five boys were actually, four of them were treated and cured of their disease, and the study ultimately had 19 of 20 kids uh, cured of a lethal disease, but it's not a good idea. And I'll finish by saying that the Lenti platform is very different in this case than the Gamma Retro, so that improvement has made a big difference in the field over the last decade because you can actually, uh, it integrates in a fundamentally different way, and that's understood on a molecular basis and clinical basis. So to make a long story short, that's the history, and we've come a long way over the last five years. When Bluebird started in 2010, gene therapy was still on the side of a bad word. It's now gotten uh, a lot better because you actually have results where you have one-time curative therapies on board. I'll kick it over to Feng now to talk about how you do this in a targeted fashion, and that's still on a preclinical stage. But there is a different set of challenges, but it holds huge promise. Well, actually, if I... Sorry. You want to... He'll turn it on for you here. Okay. Uh, before we hand it over to Feng, maybe you can tell us about uh, where you're at today and also tell us about some of the other uh, clinical activities ongoing in the field of lentiviral and, uh, and also AAV um, uh, gene delivery. And, and again, as, as you mentioned, we'll hear in the brain uh, from Steve Paul later in the, the next panel. Yeah. So, uh, thank you. I'm usually uh, try to avoid the advertisement when I'm up here. So, but I'll, I'll give it broadly about uh, AAV. So, there's a lot of activity there trying to understand these different uh, AAV uh, constructs and what their impact is on the body and their tropism. Where do they go? Which cells do they target? And how do you control the immune reaction? There's been tremendous progress in hemophilia B in that case, where you can actually have it, have it produce factor for you. In this case, you're going to the liver and it's producing quantities that are pretty sizable and the hope is maybe you can have a one-time treatment there or uh, maybe a few treatments depending on how you approach it. So there's area in, in the hemophilias that are very exciting. There certainly is also recently those big news with um, a, a company called Spark where they had some phase three results in something called RPE65, which is a subset of Lieber, uh, Liebers, which is an 
eye disorder where they have a number of the children who actually re were able to restore vision so they can live a completely different, different life. So pretty uh, inspirational stuff and they're making good progress. It's safe to say that, and there's a number of other areas, but they're largely connected to either the eye, to the brain, or to the liver. As it relates to that, there's some other areas. Companies are very much investing. It's a very healthy ecosystem because you can manufacture it. People are comfortable with the safety side. So I'd say industry is, is very much on the cusp of translating what is still an evolving basic uh, science. On the Lenti side, uh, Bluebird, we have a number of programs where we're focused on uh, something called adrena leukodystrophy, or ALD, or if you've seen Lorenzo's oil, you know the disease. This is a horrifying disease of children between the age of five and seven who die a precipitous death. In this case, we've now shown in the early data in some early patients where you can do a one-time treatment and potentially stabilize the disease. We're in the midst of a phase two, three study that we hope uh, will read out starting in 16 and, and 17. We also are looking at a, a one-time curative therapy with the same product for thalassemia and sickle cell that combine to be the most common genetic disorders in the world and are a huge, huge challenge. And sickle cell, obviously, uh, we've only shown one patient with six months worth of data, but after one treatment, this patient, who was a 13-year-old boy, was able to completely come off the transfusions that was required to keep them alive, completely come off pain meds. And those of you who understand sickle cell disease know that this is a, a dramatic, dramatic change. Obviously a long way to go, but if we can uh, recapitulate that in more patients, the thought of having a one-time curative therapy for something like sickle cell uh, in the U.S. or anywhere for that matter is something that would make a dramatic impact on health systems around the world. And we talk about pricing and reimbursement, but if we talk about value in the eyes of the patient, all you have to do is speak to one severe sickle cell patient or thalassemia and understand the value and the potential of such a treatment. So that, that's some of their other players uh, on the Lenti side, but it's a little less advanced because it's a little bit of a scary place because you have to be able to manufacture these particles, uh, which isn't straightforward. It's a little easier on the other side of the platform. Feng, tell, tell us about uh, 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 genome editing. Um, I'm very excited to be here. First, I want to thank Mark for inviting me here. I'm also uh, fairly nervous uh, because Mark was on my PhD defense committee, and he asked me the question that I couldn't answer, so I feel um, this might be a second defense. Um, I, I also want reserved. to thank you for, for interest uh, in this topic. So what is genome editing? So, so Nick just gave a really nice overview of what gene therapy does. And uh, genome editing is, is another iteration, uh, another way of uh, being able to treat genetic diseases. So why is it exciting? So over the past maybe decade or two decades, one of the major advances has been our ability to very rapidly sequence genomes of patients. Uh, through this, we're now identifying uh, many mutations that are either playing a causative role uh, in the disease, like mutation that cause sickle cell or cause beta thalassemia, we're also identifying mutations that may protect individuals from certain diseases. So for example, we know that CCR5 uh, null mutation protects uh, individuals from HIV infection. So this is very powerful. And, and you may ask, if we know what the mutations are, why don't we just go into a patient who is affected by the mutation and just flip it out, edit it, and, and fix it? Or if we know a mutation is good, why don't we just put it into an individual so that we, they, we can immunize them against certain diseases? Turns out the genome is very complicated. The human genome has three billion letters. Um, it's very, very long, and it's very repetitive. It's just four different uh, bases, A, T, G, and C. So to go into this enormously complicated genome and to make a very precise change um, is very difficult. And it wasn't until very recently that our ability to do this has become very easy and, 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 and very um, cheap to do. So how do you um, go about um, editing the genome and how do you go about fixing it? So there has been um, many technologies developed to do this. Uh, it was started with uh, meganucleases and zinc finger nucleases uh, to the more recent technologies called Talens and also CRISPR-Cas uh, technology. And all these technologies um, actually fall to a basic mechanism, which was actually worked out uh, by folks at Brandeis and also uh, uh, at Memorial Sloan Kettering. The idea is that if you can take a nucleus, which is like a scalpel, and go into the genome and just make a cut, make a slit in exactly the right position in the DNA of a cell, then you can trigger the, the normal mechanisms of a cell that repairs DNA damage to be able to edit the sequence from a specific location. And this is called genome uh, editing. 
And so the trick for doing this uh, falls to the ability to build a scalpel that's easy and cheap to use. And that's what all these genome editing technologies uh, uh, falls to. And so how, how does it really work? The, the most uh, advanced generation technology called CRISPR system uh, is kind of like a search and replace function uh, for a computer word processor. So think of Cas9 or CPF1, uh, these enzymes, as the search function. And all you have to do is to give it a, a, a search string. Uh, and this search string is in the form of a short RNA. It has 20 letters, and you, you give it any sequence you want that matches the site in the genome that you want to edit. And the, the search string, this RNA, will bas basically take the Cas9 or CPF1 enzyme and go to the right spot and then make that uh, DNA double-stranded cut. When that happens, you can also provide it a repair template with the desired sequence, and that will allow you to slip in um, a mutation that repairs a disease mutation or a mutation that puts in a protective uh, mutation. So this is a very powerful technology because the CRISPR-Cas9 or CRISPR-CPF1 system is very modular. Unlike a small molecule that you design to treat a drug, you have to both figure out how, how the bioavailability of the molecule works and also how the molecule targets uh, the, the molecular target all in the same package. With the Cas, uh, Cas9 or CPF1 system, um, what you have to do is, you, what, what you can do is you can separate it to become modular. There's the delivery uh, vehicle, and then there's the, the cargo, which is the enzyme and the RNA guide. And so depending on the tissue and depending on the disease, the, the cargo and, and the guide uh, doesn't change, and you just change the, the delivery vehicle to suit the molecular target uh, disease uh, tissue that you want to uh, deliver it to. And then if you want to fix different mutations, the enzyme doesn't change. You give it a different search string. And so these different modular components make it much more easily uh, adjustable to be able to uh, retarget this uh, therapy uh, to different kinds of disease conditions. And so this makes it possible to perform different kinds of treatments. And largely, we can divide it into two different categories. There's something called ex vivo therapy, where you take cells out of the body uh, fix the mutation and then put it back into the patient. This is amenable to blood disorders in particular, uh, sickle cell, thalassemia, skid. The second is ex vi uh, in vivo therapy where organs uh, may not always be um, possible to take out. You can't take out the brain, fix it, and then put it back into the patient. And so in those cases, you may want to deliver directly using viral vectors, um, a AAV or lentiviruses, and then, and then fix the mutation uh, directly in situ. So this is very powerful, but it's not without challenges. There are, there are many challenges. Uh, they, uh, uh, they sort of fall into a specificity of the system. You want to make the target the change, but you also don't want to cause too many other side effects, especially if those happen in oncogenes uh, that can lead to cancer and, and could be very devastating. Uh, immunogenicity, these enzymes come from microbial sources. Uh, they may not be well tolerated by the human body. Um, delivery systems that are universal, that are applicable for many different tissues. And then also, there are many different kinds of cells. Some are more amenable to one type of editing, and others are amenable to others. So being able to generate uh, universal solutions will be very important. And also, there are ethical concerns, which I think we'll discuss at the end of the panel. Um, so, so that's all. Thank you. Uh, Feng, th thank you. The, in, in terms of the, the challenges you mentioned at the end, which one do you think is the, the, the biggest problem? Is it immunogenicity, delivery, reaching various cells. So, Yeah, I, th I think out of these different challenges, uh, delivery is probably one of the major challenges. Um, there are many different uh, tissue organs, and to be able to deliver um, the, the enzyme system uh, efficiently to most cells, uh, to enough cells to have an effect, I think is, is very challenging. Um, the second, um, probably also equally important, is the ability to be able to um, make the desired edit um, with high enough efficiency. Uh, we can knock out genes, remove genes very active, uh, efficiently, but to make a very fine change, to actually make a precise edit, uh, especially in, in brain cells and other cells that don't replicate very quickly, uh, is still very challenging. Great. Thank you. So, so why don't we move from the, this, um, uh, the science to the clinical setting, and, and in particular, and, and Nick uh, uh, talked about uh, some clinical applications, but I, I want to uh, ask Peggy now to, to weigh in uh, very specifically on uh, what you see as some of the regulatory issues uh, for the, uh, the development of these uh, therapies. Well, thank you, and I guess, you know, that 
uh, from the regulatory perspective, you know, the, the real obligation is to help deliver on the promise of science for patients and to try to deal with um, evolving technologies and emerging new issues in as flexible and nimble a way as possible. And I think it speaks to a couple of, you know, very broad themes, if I, if I may. You know, one is the importance of, you know, really early and ongoing engagement, not just FDA or other regulatory authorities around the world should not just be waiting until new therapies appear as, you know, completed applications crossing the threshold, but really engaging very early on to understand what are the emerging capabilities, not just the clinical um, trials that might be being planned, but, you know, really what, where is the science going, what are the kinds of issues that can be anticipated, how should both the early research and then the translation into the clinical setting be structured to be able to, as efficiently as possible, ask and answer the critical questions. And here I might add that, you know, I think many probably in this room and elsewhere, you know, think of FDA as always looking, you know, for how to say no. Um, but really, you know, you look at the opportunities here and the, the, the chance to, you know, not just provide better treatments, but, you know, prevent disease, cure disease, and what that will mean for patients, the healthcare system, um, and beyond. And, you know, really the idea is, is to find ways, even with the complexity that is before us, you know, to, to help see this, this through. And that involves, um, you know, for one thing, what was mentioned, the setback that occurred with the, um, unanticipated but unfortunate death of Jamie Gelsinger and, and other um, adverse events associated with the treatment, you know, the engagement of the regulatory authority, I think, can add trust and confidence as a new therapy evolves and as we begin um, to, to really move from the initial discovery and, and possibility into uh, clinical trials and then ultimately into the marketplace. I think also it should be appreciated that not only can the regulators um, provide real input as the science is being shaped, as I was discussing, but regulatory authorities, in particular the FDA, also do research themselves that helps to advance the development of the, the product, whether it's in terms of um, better understanding some of the safety uh, issues that may emerge, addressing some of the issues about um, product uh, stability or manufacture, and, and some of the, um, the efficacy issues as well. And I think, you know, FDA scientists did contribute to um, uh, some of the work to, to help better protect against the immune reaction to um, the viral vectors um, and has, has helped in other areas as well. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, it, it really is uh, an exciting time and I think the, the vision for gene therapy is expanding dramatically in terms of all the different types of gene therapy. So there's no one answer to your question about sort of the, the what will the clinical uh, context look like, but I really wanted to underscore the fact that um, I think that we will make the most progress and really be able to realize the opportunities here as efficiently as possible if we think about this as, as a real partnership um, with the regulator being part of the early discussions. And that involves some risks on the part of the scientific community and industry in terms of sharing the emerging concerns, but that is what's needed. To, to really move forward as swiftly as we can, because if we don't understand the emerging um, uh, concerns and potential uh, problems, then, you know, they will no doubt declare themselves, but better to declare themselves early and in a way where we can constructively work together. Nick? Yeah, I was just, just going to add uh, that, first of all, 
Peggy, I think what's gone on in the last five to ten years at the agency to, from an industry perspective is a huge and helpful uh, shift, not only in the U.S., but on a, on a global basis for companies like ours that, that start with a long investment. Bluebird actually was founded back in 1993, and there are many investors who are long gone who spend millions and millions of dollars on this because you just don't know. Timing is everything in life. But the regulatory environment now in U.S. and globally and the appreciation of risk benefit is extremely positive. So when you go and you engage with a complicated technology, but you do it in the context of either diseases that are very, very severe or ones where you have dramatic loss of life, there's a different dialogue, at least in our experience, that's happening now. It is not a one-size-fits-all, and I suspect it's not true across every component of all the agency, et cetera, but at least in the cell and gene therapy division, we found them to be extremely collaborative, engaged, interested in the science, and really sort of wanting to understand, calling us, saying, hey, where's the latest data? That's a very helpful uh, informal and obviously formal interaction that helps us gain energy and also so you're not sort of roaming around in the dark. One of the big challenges for an industry like us is regulatory risk is, is very daunting and scary because that's, you know, that can be years and years and you could be out of business. So understanding where you stand, understanding the expectations on something as complicated as this, that is not without risk. When you have a random integration event in your DNA, in cells you put back in that are rapidly dividing, that is a non-zero risk. And there's nothing I can say or any scientist can say that that's zero readily admit that. If you're the mom of an ALD boy who will be dead in a few years, there is a consideration and it should be a balance in that dialogue. And I'm not saying it's necessarily, hey, freeze game, just let them try whatever they want. No, but there should be an adjusted regulatory path that considers that risk benefit. And we've found that to be very supportive, whether it's breakthrough, I know you were a champion early on on a special medical use protocol, which eventually got called something else into a smaller subset. I'd wish it had stayed alive on the broader interaction because I think it really is more like the way drug development should be done because you can only do so much early on and then you've got to regulate over time as you understand more about these drugs. And Europe is doing the same thing with adaptive licensing programs interact. So on the whole, gene therapy is benefiting from these and that regulatory environment, maybe you can comment on it, feels, feels much better and you're not being hauled in front of Congress as much as uh, perhaps you used to. Well, certainly um, uh, not as much for me anymore. <laughs> um, but, I, but you raise another point that I wanted to mention, and Mark, forgive me if you wanted no, no, to move no. on. But, you know, I think this is also an area where it is really important that we think on a global scale. Certainly science is international, and many of the breakthroughs, new discoveries, and studies, um, both basic and clinical, are not going to happen exclusively in the United States and already, you know, important work is going forward elsewhere. And I think, you know, for regulatory authorities, we increasingly need to, and I still say we, um, but it's increasingly necessary to, to really work in new ways to share information, to try to develop um, regulatory approaches um, in common ways. And it is confusing and difficult for companies, I recognize at the present time, um, that there can be, you know, significant differences. For one thing, there are differences between um, countries' laws as it relates to regulatory activities and pathways. There are differences in um, social values and risk tolerance. Um, there certainly are differences in some of the ethics that, that um, ethical frameworks that, that can um, bear influence as well. But all of that said, I think it's, it's really crucial that, again, building on the science, you know, we look at how together we can figure out how to uh, regulate some of these emerging new products, and especially when it gets very complex and challenging, if we can work together as a regulatory community across borders and work across sectors, the academic research community, industry, uh, and government to figure out what are the best solutions that even when there are risks, um, I think it is, bet it is easier to come to important decisions and bring clarity to decisions that need to be made. Great. Well, why don't we, I know there's a lot more on the, the scientific side, the clinical and regulatory side that we will want to discuss, but I want to get to the questions from the audience. Uh, but I, I do want to uh, discuss two additional issues. One. Uh, let's talk about uh, distribution, uh, pricing, reimbursement, how the healthcare system will deal 
uh, with uh, what in some cases could be uh, uh, cures, rapid cures, uh, you know, one-shot cures. And, and Glenn, uh, maybe you can uh, tell us as you see this kind of um, a therapy coming down the pike, what thoughts go through your mind uh, as to how the, the system will deal with this? Where do you see the pressure points? Well, I think the first pressure, pressure point is a political pressure point. And, and I think that uh, uh, in, in looking at, at the institution uh, where I was uh, privileged to be for 15 years, I, I asked questions, what could we do that other really great institutions couldn't do? And it occurred to me that we could work with a population that already felt extraordinarily loyal uh, and extraordinarily uh, close to us in ways that certainly when I was in Chicago or when I was in Boston probably could not have done. And so I, I think uh, my colleagues and I committed early on that we would attempt, uh, our aspiration was to sequence all of our patients. Uh, and um, uh, we worked for about six to seven years in order to find uh, a partner. Uh, and we found a partner. Uh, and. Uh, we have 100,000 sequences. We have 170,000 consents. Uh, we will hit 250,000 sequences uh, in a couple of years. Mm -hmm. Now, that's obviously, I believe, an interesting conditioning, an interesting way of framing a relationship between us as providers and us as a payer, since we're both a payer and a provider, uh, and our partners, either the patients or the members. Because I think, I mean, I think gene therapy is different. Uh, when we talk to when we talk to our men and women who are care getters, as caregivers, mm -hmm. um, there's a there's a different intensity and a different uh, challenge uh, uh, on our part to explain the difference between uh, somatic cell and germline. Uh, you know, I'm in the middle of rural Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. uh, gene therapy is a is a pretty spooky thing, uh, and so kind of moving slowly through one stage to another and really moving into activated human beings that are part of the balancing act, part of the decision making, is something that I think we can do in a big enough population that will be uh, perhaps somewhat scalable, somewhat generalizable to other populations that have a different uh, type of skepticism uh, in terms of, of the provider, a payer, a member, patient. Uh, divide. The other thing, obviously, which you're alluding to is to look at value over time. And since we have a very stable demography and since we have a very high market share on both the provider payer side, uh, we have as close to a lifetime uh, health record, uh, both in terms of outcome as well as cost. Uh, and there are a few other systems that are like that. And I believe that, that the consequence of some of the consolidation we were talking about in the other panel will move us incrementally closer to that. And that's a big deal because pricing right now uh, is, is based against an unknown benchmark. And when I think about pricing, even for, you know, even for curative therapy for hepatitis C, I can look at the opportunity costs of the, the liver transplants. I can look at a huge amount of stuff because we're essentially in a global uh, in, a, in a global budget or a global capitation situation for almost 50% of our patients, and they're there forever. And that, that adds some baseline data that's just not available in most other markets. So I think we can add an awful lot to a rational pricing situation. Nick, Peggy, do you want to add anything about pricing? Well, not particularly, um, but no, I'm, I'm kidding. It, it's, I think rather than talking about gene therapy, I think the relevant part is to talk about we're sort of operating on an extreme. The reason gene therapy gets pulled into this conversation very aggressively is what if you had a one-time curative therapy of, of a young boy or that's five years old that it goes from dying within five years to living 60, 70 years? How do you value something like that from all stakeholders? So if we walked into Geisinger or we walked into Blue Cross Blue Shield, I'd be curious about your perspective of how is the dialogue different? Right, or sickle cell disease that has been recently published that cost five, six, seven, up $10 million over the life of, of that patient. What, in your mind, how do you, what's the best way for this dialogue to occur in a closed system where you have such a, a sort of 
perfect understanding of your population versus others where the stickiness of patients on average I hear is in the order of one, two years. How, how do, what are the, the challenges there and how should a little company like Bluebird or folks like us engage appropriately? Well, I, you know, I think if, if, you, if you want to do the most highly probable um, reasonable result experiment, you start with the best environment that, that you can, and it's an artificial environment, but it's one that would be similar to ours, similar to about four or five other systems, and you ask the question. And then once you get the answer, then you have to go out to a much more heterogeneous systems where there's patient flow in and out. But you obviously have a very compelling uh, argument to start with if you've got a curative therapy. And then the question is, what's the data that you use in order to rationally price against, you know, against a lot of the opportunity costs? But I think you start uh, with, uh, you know, with a, a beta test in a system where you can actually capture everything over a, a significant period of time. I mean, that would be so. so one of the now, things. Now, the other thing you have to do is, you know, you 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 have, and I and I mentioned this earlier. You have to have a tolerance for failure, and it's a tolerance for economic failure as well as a tolerance for, uh, for medical failure. Uh, and again, um, uh, you know, we have this religious conviction that if we could extract a significant amount of the crap that's out there, uh, that you know, that really brings no value at all, and redistribute that. And some of that was our own decision, obviously, and some of it was market-based. We, we could tolerate 15 to 20 percent of things that didn't work. Uh, that may not be the same if you go into other, you know, other uh, organizations that, you know, have a, an extraordinarily slim margin, or it may not be the same if you go into an organization that doesn't have the same kind of commitment. Maybe so we can get to, to the questions. I, I want to, but I, I, I want the, the panel, and maybe I'll start with Feng, mm -hmm. to, to um, touch on some of the ethical Issues we we heard, of course, already about the the uh, you know cost benefit and and some of the mm -hmm. the uh, potential adverse ev events of uh, in gene therapy you know uh, viral vectors integrating in sites and disrupting genes leading to cancer and so on. But uh, I think the the issue that's on people's minds today is with more precise genome editing coming along uh, and the publication last uh, summer uh, from a, a group in China of, of editing of, of human uh, embryos. Uh, the, the ethical dimensions uh, of that uh, uh, kind of uh, possibility. So, Feng? Mm -hmm. so, one, so one of the ethical concerns surrounding genome editing, uh, especially recently, has been uh, the idea of somatic cell editing versus uh, germline cell editing. Now, when we, do, when we talk about gene therapy, uh, traditionally uh, we talk about somatic editing, which means changing cells in our body that don't get passed on to the next generation. But once we um, edit germ cells, uh, germline cells, then um, these mutations that we're introducing can get passed on to subsequent generations uh, because they, they enter into the human germline. And so you can treat these diseases either way. You can either uh, repair mutations in the, in the body and fix the, the condition within the individual, uh, affected individual, or you can uh, treat diseases by correcting the embryo so that you make sure the subsequent generations uh, no longer carry the disease-causing mutation. There are significant um, challenges with that, and there are both ethical as well as um, uh, technical challenges. So around the ethical aspect, when we are doing genome editing in the germline, um, we don't always necessarily know what is the, the best mutation to put in. There are a lot of things that have to do with uh, germline editing uh, where um, we are understanding of the human genetics and the way that a mutation will interact with the rest of the genome is, is, is still very, very much in the infancy. And, and just because we know one mutation works in one way within the genome of one individual, the genomic background of other individuals are very different. And, and when we put a mutation into other backgrounds, there's no guarantee that it will behave the same way as we would predict it. There are also enormous uh, technical challenges. Uh, how specific is genome editing? The current generation technology is not specific enough. We don't have confidence that it will not make other undesirable changes within the germline. And so all these different challenges um, point to the fact that we, we shouldn't um, do genome editing in the germline right now for therapeutic purposes. Uh, there are other um, aspects, there are other perspectives too. Um, for example, um, there are 
uh, ways to be able to do genetic uh, diagnosis uh, pre-implantation so that we don't even have to consider using genome editing because when couples undergo in vitro fertilization, there are going to be a number of embryos that we can analyze and, and, and identify the ones that don't carry the mutation and, and proceed with those embryos. And so with these alternative as well as all of the, the significant caveats, um, there, there uh, really are uh, quite a debate surrounding uh, germline editing. Uh, but then again, um, depending on the group that, that's view, viewing this problem, um, there are other uh, arguments on, on either side, and, and it's really an important issue to, to discuss. Peggy? Thank you. Um, I just wanted to also add, um, Fang is of course talking about uh, human gene editing mm -hmm. at the moment. Concerns are also now being raised about um, gene editing when it comes to other kinds of organisms, mm -hmm. and in particular the possibility that you could engineer organisms in new ways mm -hmm. that then could be used um, to cause deliberate harm. And, mm -hmm. you know, certainly in an earlier life for me, I worked a lot on um, biological terrorism, biological weapons issues, and that community is, you know, raising the issue about do we need similar kinds of discussion and, and awareness building around this potential uh, concern, particularly, I think, as people recognize that these new technologies, mm -hmm. um, you know, are probably pretty easy to use. Um, I think the other issue that emerges, and it's it's kind of an ethical issue, it's also a value issue, but I think that the scientific community really has an obligation to start now talking to the public and to policymakers about what all of this is and what it means because I think that we have huge opportunities before us, but we also know that if the public and policymakers don't understand, if they overreact if they misinterpret that it can can really slow progress in our ability to deliver on the mm -hmm. promise of, of um, uh, this emerging technology mm -hmm. and certainly we know from the experience with um, what some call GMO I was trained to call it genetically engineered um, foods um, and other approaches that uh, the the public can you know really react in very different ways and you can have a delayed reaction as well after things are already well entrained then questions start to be raised and it's even more difficult to address them then. So I just wanted to mention that. Yeah. And it's probably worth mentioning that the, the um, National Academy of Sciences mm -hmm. and the National Academy of Medicine have a joint task force along with some academies of other countries mm -hmm. to uh, address the ethical issues related to uh, genome editing. Uh, and uh, which will lead to a, an international conference, I believe, in December, uh, and there uh, a report that will be rendered uh, probably next summer, uh, much as has been done previously by the academies in the context of stem cells. Uh, so this is an evolving landscape, but the, certainly the scientific community has become very proactive, and it's not just this country, other the academies of other countries, for example, in Germany, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, issued uh, an interim report on the situation. I think everybody's very, very al alert to the uh, the importance of really assessing the eth ethical dimensions before proceeding. Yep. Yeah, I just, just want to mention that the early results, the return of early results from even our initial sequencing effort has, has surfaced some very interesting reactions uh, among the people that we're responsible to uh, and responsible for. And my guess is, you know, if you're more proactive in that kind of of active interaction, it's, it's going to be a lot better, a lot more positive. There's obviously going to be a wide range of reactions than, mm -hmm. you know, having it interpreted through a couple of uh, idiotic uh, presidential candidates. Who shall remain nameless, apparently. Fang, one point before we open to the questions. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And, and I think as I With which part? <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> no, I, I absolutely agree that as scientists and especially um, folks who, are, who, who have a deep understanding of the technology and the risks and the caveats, um, it's very important to, to um, be engaged and, and be um, participating in leading the discussion and education. And, and the, the December meeting and, uh, at NAS will be a particularly uh, interesting one because China and France 
um, uh, especially China, the Chinese Academy, uh, where the first human embryo editing experiment took place, uh, will be participating and, and reaching agreement in terms of regulation and how to perceive the, uh, the, the future development of the technology will be quite important. Great. So I'd like to open it to questions now, and uh, I think we have some mics. So we have a question over here. Couple questions, but hi, I'm at Jolly Biofarm Insight. Uh, Dr. Fang, what, mo what looks most promising um, in human use for CRISPR today? Yeah, thank you for the question. So, um, so uh, the translation of CRISPR uh, into the clinic um, is is um, it is very promising, and and there are different areas. And I think the initial uh, hurdles are probably surrounding the area of delivery, and and so that's. That means uh, diseases where we have ready uh, delivery methodologies like tr in vitro transfection or viral delivery might be most amenable. So for ex vivo therapy, um, blood-related disorders like thalassemia uh, or skin, uh, maybe some of the most tractable diseases, lowest hanging fruits. For in vivo, um, areas where, um, where we can have enough uh, delivery efficiency to reach sufficient number of cells to get a therapeutic effect uh, is probably the most attractive. Uh, so these include maybe the retina, um, eye diseases. So certainly the spark uh, therapeutics result is very, very exciting. And that shows that we can deliver e to efficient, uh, sufficient number of cells. Uh, maybe the inner cochlea as well for hearing disorders because you can treat sufficient number of cells within a confined uh, space. Uh, systemic disorders will probably be much more challenging uh, just because both production of sufficient vectors as well as getting enough cells uh, will be more, more difficult. Nick? I yeah, just wanted to add to that, I think, you, to, to what you said, Fang, is that one of the things that people don't appreciate about this concept of ex vivo gene therapy is it doesn't just sort of naturally happen. There's an entire infrastructure that has to occur when you have to get, acquire the cells, you have to bring them to a place centrally, mm -hmm. transduce the cells with the virus, freeze them down and send them back. That sort of deployment challenge is something that a few companies are working on, and that is something that has to be done with any of this early adoption, primarily of gene therapy in ex vivo setting. So that's something to remember, but the other bit that's really neat about editing is these are not either or. One of the things that many of us are looking at is combinations. So you can think very easily about, let's say, a lentivirus that delivers a globin product for a, sickle, for a sickle cell or for thal, but at the same time, in the same construct or in parallel, you, on those target cells in the same manufacturing process, you put one or multiple nucleases of, of any flavor. We use megatals or CRISPRs, and you do a stun and run. You do something. You, you manipulate that cell in a fashion that is in addition to adding your gene that will, again, rig that cell in the direction you want to go. I think that's where you're going to see the early applications. Oncology is a very easy place to look at that. You look at CAR therapies or TCR therapies that you've seen out there where they engineer these onto the cells, but at the same time you do something else to manipulate the tumor microenvironment with a nucleus. And you can pick your favorite target, and it can either be done in the virus, so you have one or multiple in the lentivirus being delivered in a permanent fashion, or like I said, the gene gets delivered permanently, but then you do a stun run. So those applications will come, but you do need to make sure you have the improvements. So it's coming, but it's a horizon and it's going to be a convergence of all the technologies. Great. We have a question over there. The existing uh, moratorium, if you will, on modification of the human germ line was essentially one uh, accomplished informally when a group of scientists got together for the Asilomar Conference now many years ago. Uh, that served us well. Now that we're at the point that we're discussing uh, reconsideration of uh, changing the, the human germ line, what do you anticipate the process might be? How would that uh, be handled uh, to look both at the ethical and, and social implications of that in today's environment? I'd like to take that. Um, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, so, so with the recombinant DNA of Silomar has been, has been one of the um, really important moments for, for deciding the, the fate of recombinant DNA. 
uh, in today, um, we are now in an era where communication is much more rapid and, and information is much more transparent and readily accessible. So that's great because it makes it possible for us to um, make all the information accessible and publicly available so that we can make sure that um, we can uh, provide the, all the information necessary for people to understand what is germline editing, what is somatic editing, uh, what are the pros and what are the cons, and then the different voices, uh, the patient groups, the physicians, the, the scientists, the policymakers can all provide their input. And this particular forum that's happening uh, in December in DC uh, will be a really exciting event because it will be convening all these different voices together into the same room so that people can really um, holistically consider all of them. I'm a scientist, so I, I, I don't have the expertise in the policy and also I certainly don't know all the areas of the, um, the clinical practice or, or the patient group, I understand that um, there, are, there are very uh, grievous diseases that we really want to treat, but I certainly don't have enough expertise. And, it's, and, and what I will be able to do is when in this conversation I can provide a technical and a scientific input, but then there will be other folks to come in and provide the input on, uh, on these other aspects, other perspectives, and together uh, generating a, a, um, a roadmap and, and a particular set of um, understanding will be very important. And also aligning these different countries that have different ethical beliefs uh, will be very important too. And so far I think everybody's in agreement. Um, we had a pre-planning meeting a couple of weeks ago and I think it was a very productive one. And then I think I'm really looking forward to the December meeting. I think it will be, will be a productive meeting. Yeah. Nick, can I believe? Yeah. It, just real quick, it's just that we got to avoid catch-all phrases. We got to avoid things at the highest level where you sort of paint with this broad brush that has the potential to have dramatic effects on innovation, dramatic effects on our ability to innovate across the sector. So these comments, whether tweets or others from politicians, et cetera, do not help, whether that's pricing or whether that's things like this that are very serious science issues. So we need to deliberate on them but not overreact because that's not in the interest of patients who we're all here to serve. And I was just going to add, you know, that of course I think that there are many ways that one can provide oversight on these kinds of issues, um, and it can be generated by the scientific community and follow the Asilomar model, and I think that's what the effort here is, is to really um, bring thoughtful people together, and not just scientists, but, but ethicists and policy makers and healthcare providers and, and uh, patients and others together to think about what's the best way to navigate a complex and still evolving set of, of technologies. Um, or you can have, you know, a more uh, heavy-handed approach of something could be misapplied and therefore, you know, let's put a hold on it um, until we understand it better or maybe put a hold on it um, going forward for the indefinite future. And I think, you know, finding the right balance between um, responsible science, accountability and oversight, um, but not, uh, you know, really being afraid of the potential downsides to the point that we actually um, put limits on realizing the opportunity. Yeah, I, uh, I would argue that, you know, it's a terrific thing to have a consensus or an attempt at a consensus, but I also think that there has to be uh, a, a way of looking at some beta testing for real live uh, data accumulation. And I think that there will be certain uh, certain unusual markets where that, that will be more doable. And, and I don't mean that in a patronizing way uh, at all. Um, so, yep. Thank you. It, it's also, I think, an, an really important example of why there needs to be this international conversation because, you know, we cannot believe that the decisions we make here about the policy will be followed everywhere else and that, you know, we really need to bring the best minds together to think through these issues in a coordinated way that will hopefully help us move the ball forward. I, I got the signal that we can have time for one more question and uh, so go over here. Sam, here we go. Hold on. 
You know, uh, uh, when we begin to talk about uh, uh, policy and how that overlays on the scientific things that we do, it's always, you know, a frightening moment for those of us that really think that science can, can do these things. But I think, and what's more frightening, is the fact that we're speaking to policymakers who are more than scientifically illiterate. So that becomes a, a, a really frightening moment. I, uh, I said uh, that earlier. I think. <laughs> so, but one of the things that science will drive along, and you know, we're doing that already, or, uh, colleagues of mine are doing it already, is when we look at this exciting new promise uh, uh, for gene therapy of being able to correct what's not there and then to fix things in a positive way, we're going to be able to do it in the future with regulation of those editing mechanisms. And once you're, you're, you're able to regulate, regulate with small molecules that you can uh, uh, move forward and have patients take, you will change a lot of what the policymakers fear. And I think we're going to be getting there in, in a scientific way very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. It's going to uh, help change the world, uh, not only with the promise of gene therapy, but with the promise of being able to make people feel comfortable that we can regulate it in an old-fashioned way. So I think it, that bodes very well, even for the people who are so scientifically illiterate. Well, terrific. Well, with that, I think we unfortunately <laughs> run out of time, so I'm sure the panelists would be happy to take additional questions here offline, but uh, please join me in thanking them.